Welcome to another episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Now, historically speaking, the most powerful person in America is a religious white man. Well, more specifically, the Christian, or should I say Christian, white man. I'm joined now by Carl Lentz, lead pastor of Hillsong East Coast, a church with nearly 10,000 members. Carl, how are you, my friend? I am blessed to be here, and I'm frustrated that you chose that shirt <laughs> just to make me feel worse about, um, you know, everything I got going on. So thank you for having me. The, the trick, the trick, Carl, buy smaller shirts, they make you look bigger. This is as small as you can buy them. This is this medium. <laughs> I love it. Well, look, let's, let's dive into things because... Your lead pastor at a phenomenal church, a church I've attended. Uh, I know that America, we are religious people, generally speaking. And religion, it teaches you compassion. It teaches you empathy. It teaches yeah. you sympathy. But I recently read that compassion without confrontation is like mm. fruitless, sentimental commiseration. So, Carl, I am here wow. to have a uncomfortable but compassionate confrontation. Yeah. And conversation. Um, segregation in America outlawed mid 1960s. Right. However, every Sunday morning in houses of worship, America is about as segregated as it ever can be. Mm. Why is that? Because of the stuff we've said, you, you it's hard to listen to a preacher preach if you know that that preacher believes in systems that are hurting your people. Mm. So it's safer sometimes to go to a black church, if you're, especially if you're a black American, than it is to go to a diverse church. <laughs> Keep in mind, that's the biggest air quote of mm -hmm. all time. Uh, because you don't, I, I don't know if I can trust somebody who claims to love Jesus and professes to teach me about this man, yet you're silent on issues that hurt my people. You're silent when I need you. In, in areas that I'm, you know, desperately oppressed. And I think that's why people are like, you know what, it's cool, I'll try to reach the world, but on Sunday, I need to be safe. Why is the, uh, generically speaking, why mm. is the white church silent? Because this stuff causes problems. And I, uh -oh. I, 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 uh -oh. yeah, I don't wanna, I'm trying to like play it cool on your chair, it's a beautiful set, but, it's like a, a messy house. So have you ever had a good idea? Like I need to clean my house. And then you, you, you set out to do it and you realize our house is dirty. Every room is dirty. There's stuff underneath the couch. If you got kids, you're like, man, this closet's too crowded. And sometimes you, you know what? I'll just, I'll just let my house be dirty because it's too much work. This is what happens with racism. The moment you start looking into this, you realize, oh, oh wow, this goes all the way to the top. This is in our church choir. This is in our church administration. This is in the way we've taught the Bible. And there are a lot of Christians who set out to clean house until they find out how close to home it might come. So there are people who would rather just almost, you know, when you have guests over and mm -hmm. you put some of that stuff in that one in room. In that one room. We've been doing that with racism for decades in the American church, at least as far as I know. And that stuff's starting to overflow now. And so you're faced with two types of people, people who genuinely want to be a part of the problem or people who are genuinely upset that they got caught. Mm -hmm. That's the funny thing about racism. Some people are sorry right now because they're racist and they need to change. Other people are sorry because they got caught being racist. They don't want to fix the problem. They want to fix the optics of it. So then would you say that racism and prejudice does in fact exist inside the houses of worship? No, the moment you set foot in church, all that stuff vanishes because of Jesus. I'm kidding. You're about to throw <laughs> me off your show. I think in fact, I, it could be said that churches might be one of the biggest propagators of racist ideology in our country. Expound and, on that. Well, from the way that we operate. So there's a difference between your principle and your practical. Okay. So if my principle at Hillsong, New York City is we value all people, practically speaking, you should be able to see that. I'm sure you've had to ask yourself, are you a part of the problem or are you a part of the solution? I asked myself that question when George Floyd was murdered. And my answer was, I'm more a part of the problem than I am the solution. In that second, you're faced with a life-defining decision of going, do you put your arms up? Or do you look in the mirror and say, I never want to 
I never want to be able to say that about myself again. Does it mean I'm a horrible person? No. Does it mean, am I, who am I comparing myself to, first of all? And this is important because if, if you hear that question and immediately go, well, I'm not as bad as that guy, or I'm not as racist as that dude, my stance, it, it comes from the Old Testament where God says, I want justice, mm -hmm. oceans of it. So unless I am a part of the oceans of justice team, I'm not doing enough. I'm a part of the problem. So now I can say I believe I'm part of the solution, but it was practical changes that I, am, I finally have peace with. To give your white brothers and sisters some extra clarity and guidance, what were some of those practical changes? I leave no doubt with my children. Every commercial, every, every racist thing we see, um, every bit of oppression, it's my job. I can't control every kid in the world, but I gotta pause the TV sometimes and go, not true. I've got to grab them at a dinner and say, you see that way, the way the waiter was really kind to us when we walked in? You know, when the black family walked in, they were almost tolerated. That right there, that's not a small thing, that's a big thing. It's not that burden for me to wake up and go, oh, I'm the racial police in my house. No, I wake up and go, I'm the dad in this house. What an honor it is to protect my children and to teach them right. And then we told our neighbor about it, our neighbor does it. Our neighbor told this other dude at another house, he's doing it. Just like that, we got a neighborhood watch program within our own houses, right? This is how revolutions really start. But does it matter what you tell your children if you're not living it out as the parent or as the adult? I would rather have somebody explain to their children their messy transformation then wait till they're complete because we're just not gonna be complete. And that becomes an excuse for white people. And I know this is uncomfortable, but there's a couple little deflections that white people use like that. Better to teach what you know, even if it's son, I might have some racist stuff from the way I was brought up, but me and you are on this journey together. That seed in, in the life of a child has more impact than any parent could ever know. What would you say, because you've been out marching and at the protests, to the white person who's like, I feel uncomfortable being out here amongst the black people because like, I'm not black and I don't want it to seem disingenuous. What would you say to that white person? Welcome to being black in America, to being the only person who doesn't really know if you fit in. That's called everyday life. We have the choice of whether we want to be in a protest and be uncomfortable. You do not. You woke up black today. Mm -hmm. you, didn't have, you didn't get to choose whether people were going to accept you if people are gonna to tolerate you, if people are gonna look at you in the eye. Um, that's your reality every day. So even the notion that we get to pick and choose when we want to invade this conversation is in essence racism at its finest. I, I, I get to go home after Brooklyn and, and we get to go home to our house in our safe confines, but the people who live this, um, they don't get to go home because racism travel. Here's what frustrates me, let me be real with you. Be real. What frustrates me is you hear these sound bites um, from religious people, yeah. from Christian people, um, from people that uh, attend houses of worship that may say, it's not about race, it's about grace. <laughs> it's not about skin, it's about sin. sin. When in fact, it is about skin and it is about race yep. because the race and skin mm. is what is being punished and executed on camera in America right now. How do you reconcile the difference between <laughs> sin and ignorance? Well, it's never mattered before, sir, because we've been allowed to say ignorant things as powerful white people mm -hmm. and nobody said anything. Do you think that some white people are afraid to lose control, afraid to lose power? If I have to go lend a helping hand to a black person, hmm. if I have to go fight for equality, I may lose my position of power. Is that real? It's more real than I even want to tell you because that's um, there was a minister who uh, is of a completely different faith sect. And I, I won't even bring the name up because it'd be controversial, but he's on record years ago on a talk show. He said, some of y'all white people are worried about us getting power because you think if we did, we would treat people like you have. And he hit it on the head. And I think there are some people that are afraid of losing. They're afraid of sacrificing. They're afraid of whatever. In Christianity specifically, let's, let's zoom in on Christianity. The goal of every Christian, amongst other things, mm -hmm. is to emulate Christ. That's Correct. the goal, it's to be Christ-like. Very easy. Simple. Very simple. I ask you, 
if Jesus was walking the earth, would he be marching? Would he be posting a black square on his Instagram for Blackout Tuesday? What would Jesus be doing if he were walking the earth right now in your opinion? Well, here's what's funny about this. If people want to contend with this answer, you can go read about what he did. There's no question where Jesus would be. Where did you find him when we have record of him? Who was he with? Who was he angering is more important. You and I talked about Zacchaeus, where, where Jesus was loathed by the religious community for what? Proximity. Mm -hmm. it, he was at the dinner table. He was at the wrong parties. He was hanging out with the wrong people. He was talking to women when they weren't even allowed or even acknowledged as real human. So if you had to wonder where Jesus would be, um, you got to go back to your Bible because he's where hurting people are. Then how come so many people whose job is to emulate that one man mm. aren't there? Because it will cost them money and it will cost them um, acclaim. It might create enemies. And the problem with American Christianity is we think Jesus said, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. This difference here is the divide in our country. We're here to make peace. That means what do you have to do? You have to go find war. You have to find trouble. You have to find the hurting in order to bridge this gap. That's real. Um, if you go back to the way in which this country was founded, um, founded mm. upon men of faith, like I said, founded upon religion, I would say the early church at first were participants. Like you had a conversation with T.D. Jakes in which he yeah. said this, and you was parallel. The early church were participants in oppression and then became complicit with oppression. Yeah. And now is silent. The current church is silent mm. about oppression. The house that the, the, our, the white person's figurative forefathers built is fractured. How can you, as a religious, a Christian white man, repair the broken house that your figurative forefathers built? It leads me to ask you a question first, if I may. Please. And I want you to answer honestly because you've done such a good job of being a conduit of conversations. But as a black man who loves Jesus and you are trying to understand church, what do you need to hear from pastors that up until now you love and respect, but you feel like they're silent? What would give you peace to know that there is hope on the horizon? The first thing I need to hear is something. Even if it's wrong. The even if it's clumsy. Even if it's wrong, because again, I will say this, denial, spelled D-E-N-I-A-L, don't even know I am lying. And you can't address mm. a problem that you don't admit exists. Jeez. You can't address yeah. a problem you don't admit exists. Mm. And my, pro my issue is that so many people within houses of worship, so many people within churches, so many people um, within synagogues, if you will, ah. so many people across the world, across America, don't even acknowledge that a problem exists. Mm. It took a black man getting murdered on camera by an officer with his knee in his neck to finally wake people up. Hmm. So my first thing I want to hear, Carl, would just be anything. You know, I said something that it frustrated some people early on, but I said we need to treat racism like we do COVID. Mm -hmm. If our country poured as much effort into racism, which is more evil than that virus, what do we do? Uh, we assumed everybody had it. We listened to the experts and we, we altered our entire lives to make sure that this virus didn't get a stronghold in our communities. So you take out COVID and put racism there. Let's assume white people, and this frustrates white people. That's how you know something's up. Let's assume that all of us have racist tendencies. People are like, wait, wait, are you calling me a racist? I don't know, maybe, but that's, why is that a problem? If we're really serious about this, when you, we didn't know who had COVID, so everybody went home until we knew. To, yeah. We don't know who's racist. The, the, rea the reality is you could be more racist than you think. I don't think I'm a racist man. I don't want to be, but I love you enough as my brother to go look at it again. Maybe this will help too, if I may, to talk about you know, the, the concept of white privilege, mm. right? Which isn't real. I don't kidding. <laughs> Um, but there are people here who I love and I have had conversations for hours and they just say, Carl, I love you. I appreciate it. It's just not real. I told one guy, I said, all right, let's just say that, let's just say it, it, it's not real. Okay. If I'm wrong about white privilege, it, it, but I believe it and I end up being wrong. It means I will have lived my whole life looking out for other people, making sure 
everybody else gets the first shot and I get the second, making sure people who are um, not in the mix get, get, get in it. Um, and then I find out that I was wrong. Hmm. But if you find out you're wrong at the end of your life, that white privilege was real and you didn't acknowledge it, it means you were stepping on the necks of others your whole life. Even if I'm wrong, my wrong's better than your wrong. What do you have to lose? So many people in America to that point, they love God. Whoever they call God, this deity, they love God. Mm. How can you love God and hate man? You don't. It's an affront to God. And that's why racism being synonymous with American church is such a joke because it just, it, it, it's literally the opposite of, of who we are. So for, for anybody who tries to say that, you could pretty much write them off in regards to what they're trying to tell you because if you miss this core tenet of who we are, um, you've never known the God that we know. I got a letter from a man who was in prison serving a double life sentence for killing a black man. He was in a, a white supremacist gang in prison. Um, and he told me in the letter, I hated black people. He saw a TV show in prison, one of our church services, and, and, and I don't know who messed up and allowed church services to be played in prisons. And he said something in him con convicted his heart. He began to read, he began to pray, he began to change. He said, I write you today as a man who can look at some of these black men in this prison that I used to call my enemies, I call them my brother. He has no incentive to change, e, none. He's gonna be in prison forever. But I do believe that what God can do if people are just open is miraculous like that. If you were to leave a parting action call, mm. if you were to leave a parting message to the white person of faith, mm. to the white Christian, to the white believer, to the white worshiper, mm. what would Carl Lentz say? Don't be intimidated and do not minimize what you have. I can't reach who you can reach. You can't reach who I can reach. But if you're a white American and you're going, what can I really do in suburban Tulsa? You can do more than you think. You can walk out of a restaurant. You can teach somebody that wants to learn. You can sit there with your child every night and remind them of what you believe and you just cannot minimize it because we know we serve a God that uses small things and turns it into more. And I think there are a lot more good people out there that want to help, but they feel overwhelmed. I would say don't buy that lie. Um, the hope of the world is the individual that cares. Well, I would offer the story of the Good Samaritan. And in the story of the Good Samaritan, there was a man who was beaten and left half dead on the side of the road. A priest walked by mm. and the priest looked on at this half beaten man. And I'm sure he asked himself, if I help this man, what will happen to me? And then a Levite walked by, another man walked by, and I'm sure he saw this half beaten man because he didn't stop. And I'm sure he said to himself, if I help this man, this half beaten man left for dead, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan walked by. And the Good Samaritan, he walked by and he saw this man who was half dead. And he must have asked himself, if I don't help this man, what will happen to him? So I encourage you to be like the Good Samaritan and ask yourself, if I don't help the oppressed, what will happen to them? Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. If change is truly going to start, it has to start in the houses of worship. Mm. It has to start with people of faith. It has to start with white people, black people, having an uncomfortable confrontation filled with compassion. We'll see y'all next time.